Good afternoon and good morning, everybody. My name is Tonya Rajova. I am the IFLA president-elect and president of the General Council for Libraries in the Greek Ministry of Education. And today I will be your host, the moderator, in this event, in this second part of the webinars organized by the Organizing Committee for the Support um, of Libraries. We are extremely happy to have um, with us four distinguished speakers, three IFLAM, past IFLAM uh, presidents, and very internationally well-known ladies that their names are synonymous uh, to libraries, librarianship, and innovation. And of course, we are very happy to ha have with us uh, Mrs. Uh, Anthi Katsiriku, uh, the president of the uh, Greek um, uh, librarians and information scientists. Uh, today, I am the moderator of uh, this event. And of, of course, uh, first of all, I represent the organizing committee for the support of libraries, a very um, collaborative um, effort and initiative that started back in the year 2003. And the committee has not only organized um, many highly successful conferences, but um, has also offered more than 20 workshops in the recent years in the context of the conferences and beyond them. Um, so uh, the, the activities of the committee reach more than 1,500 librarians, 120 libraries from all over Greece, but also abroad. And the organizing committee for the support of libraries is a model for equal representation and cooperation of the constituent bodies. And which are these bodies? Is the Goethe Institute? So thank you, Nicoletta. Is the Instituto Cervantes de Atenas? Thank you, Anna. Is the Athens American Center of the US Embassy in, um, in Athens? Thank you, Vasilis. It's the Library of the Hellenic Parliament. Thank you, Ellie. It's the National Library of Greece. It's the Eugenides Foundation. Thank you very much, Hara. It's the Music Library of Greece, Lilian Vuduri, Friends of Music Society. Uh, thank you, Stefania. It's the Association of Greek Librarians and Information Scientists. Thank you, Stavrula. It's the National Documentation Center. Uh, many thanks, Ioana. It's um, the Diavazodas Megalono. Uh, thank you, Despina. It's the British School of Athens. Thank you, Evie. It's the Municipal Library of New Philadelphia and New Halkidona. Um, thank you very much, Magda. It's always, I think, um, the first thing to do uh, is to, to say many thanks to the people that they are not in the screen right now, but um, without them, this event couldn't have happened. So um, I will start very fast because the most important thing is to listen to our distinguished speakers. And uh, I will give the floor uh, to Ingrid Paran. Dr. Ingrid Paran is the University Librarian Emerita at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. And before joining the university, she was an assistant deputy minister at Library and Archives of Canada, responsible for all aspects of Canada's documentary heritage. She is a senior administrator and information professional. She has an extensive academic and government experience in documentary heritage, digital technologies, and policy and standards development, at both at local but also at national and international levels. She has been a strong proponent of equitable access to information and promoting the diversity of voices in the world of information. Ingrid is a past IFLAM president and also an honorary fellow of IFLA, which means the highest distinction uh, for a person um, in IFLA, and continues to work with international organizations such as UNESCO and also IFLA representative on projects in support of the cultural heritage sector. 
Ingrid, many thanks to be here with us. And the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, uh, Tonya. I'm just going to share my screen right now. All right, I think I can begin. Um, Yes, so good afternoon, uh, good evening, and good morning from me here in Vancouver, Canada. I'm really pleased to be with you all virtually this morning, um, and also to share the screen with my distinguished colleagues, the Pithlopans, and of course, Antonia as well. Um, I would like to share with you my reflections on COVID and its impact on libraries, but really focusing more on the post COVID uh, era that we will be seeing hopefully very soon. I think we were all taken by surprise um, and even shocked by the appearance of the virus and how quickly it spread around the world and especially how long it is taking now to subside and eventually disappear. I think 18 months ago, we thought in our libraries that the virus was seen as just a disruption, a short-term event. Now we know better, unfortunately. So much has been written about what libraries are doing to meet the challenges of the pandemic and several innovative services and tools um, were discussed uh, and described during the first webcast with three IFLA presidents last April. So I'm going to focus on the future. What will libraries look like after COVID? What will they need to do to become a new library model? But surprisingly, when I was looking through the documentation, I really couldn't find that much on future thinking taking place in libraries over the next five to 10 years. It's probably understandable because libraries are very preoccupied with, with the the today, the current situation, how to survive and even to thrive during the pandemic. But I am beginning to see a lot more uh, research being done on what will, what will this look like at the end of the tunnel? How will we appear as libraries? So first, before I um, talk about the future, I just want to look at a few of the impacts that the pandemic has had on our global life including on libraries and information in general, because many of our future activities are going to address hopefully the current negative impacts from the pandemic. First, probably the biggest impact of any pandemic is the effect on people's health. There is a tremendous amount of fear and uncertainty about the virus. Who will get sick and why you and not me? Second, what is the impact of the pandemic on my livelihood, on my job, my living standards? Globally, how has it affected the economies of countries and how does that impact me and my library? Third, with the restrictions on physical gatherings, on education and travel mandated by various governments, there is a feeling of isolation, of loneliness and even depression among people around the world. Virtual meetings and gatherings really cannot replace the social connections that existed before. Fourth, and finally, the feeling of trust has been severely eroded. Trust in science and research, trust in our governments, in public institutions, and in the private sector. All these groups have on one occasion or another let us down and contributed to the general sense of hopelessness that many people feel today. So what is the role of libraries to help alleviate some of these negative impacts of the pandemic? And how will the role of libraries change in the post-pandemic world? The good news is that libraries are already addressing these challenges, not only during the past two years, but they have always in their history looked towards ensuring the public good through their core mission to provide information, authoritative information on all subjects and in all formats, to offer a space to users that is open, inclusive and adapted to user needs and to provide users with the tools and technologies that will help them to learn, to grow and to take a break when needed. 
Libraries also have a long history of networking and collaborating with each other and with other players in the information environment to achieve common goals. And increasingly, libraries are taking on a strong visible presence in advocacy and lobbying efforts to ensure the public good. What will be different in the future can be summed up in one word, acceleration. The imperative to act quickly on many fronts to come out ahead of the virus and prevent future pandemics has become crystal clear. We all fell short, libraries too, in being able to pivot quickly to address the negative impacts of the pandemic. Therefore, I think we will see the pace of change accelerate over the next five years. So I'd just like to highlight a few of the areas where this acceleration will happen. First, there is the whole complex area of digital information and digital services. In my opinion, the digital universe will grow even faster than it has in the past, which was already growing at an incredible pace. Collections will be digitized at a faster rate. After libraries closed their doors to their physical collections, patrons and researchers had no access to the vast array of print and audiovisual materials held in the libraries. This had an adverse effect on the research activities of many people. In the future, there will be a push to digitize more of the world's print collections. Perhaps there will be more funding to do so after funding agencies and individuals have experienced the serious impact the pandemic has had on advancing knowledge, research and learning by limiting access to documentary heritage. Copyright and ownership restrictions will also decrease in certain areas, I have to say, to allow for more access to relevant and important information related to matters of urgency, such as health and disease, and increasingly to worldwide concerns, such as climate change. I could cite many examples today of some steps already underway to improve access to scientific material currently held behind paywalls. In Canada, the Granting Council for Sciences has partnered with science publishers to immediately make accessible any data coming out of research being done on COVID. While this is a good first step, such a measure is only a temporary one, and there is no compliance mechanism in place yet. However, I feel that once we put our foot in the door to change how access to scientific and scholarly material is provided, we can take it to the next level to advocate successfully for more open access to this material. Another example is the Welcome Trust, which has developed a joint statement on the push for more open access so that research findings and data relevant to the pandemic are shared rapidly and openly. The statement has been signed by hundreds of institutions, researchers, and publishers around the world. For libraries with institutional repositories, this liberation of previously restricted information will enhance their value to the general public. There are many more examples around the world of moving the goalposts on open access and other areas such as open science and open data. Related to open access is the impact the pandemic has had on the extremely serious issue of the digital divide. With so much isolation in our communities during the pandemic, those with good internet access could still function quite well to communicate with their colleagues and their families, to use the library virtually to access eBooks, to continue to perform some work um, in, in their regular life, and even to order a meal or so. But think of those people who have no or limited access to the internet. The pandemic has intensified the digital divide and demonstrated to us what it means to be unconnected, especially for our vulnerable populations and in regions around the world with limited or no access to the internet. Canada is a big country geographically, and there are many rural areas and regions in the north with very limited access to the internet. Governments are now realizing the importance of having all citizens connected digitally for social and economic reasons. 
And it's another expensive undertaking, but the realization is that without it, civil society is not fulfilling its potential. Libraries can advocate for digital equity through broadband extensions and sustainable infrastructure and can populate the web with more information resources. Collaboration in the research world during the pandemic took on a special urgency to ensure that knowledge creation could continue despite limited means to do so. The digital technologies that we use to communicate and collaborate were essential and will continue to develop to allow for more collaborative and sustainable work and networking to take place. So libraries have the opportunity to be in the mix of these developments to allow for greater equity and openness and offer their users new tools and spaces to collaborate. So speaking of spaces, when libraries were forced to close their doors for many months around the world, the feeling of isolation really became apparent and added to the anxiety caused by the virus. The meeting and learning spaces that libraries provided to their users have proven to be vital to the public's well-being and will be even more so in the future. As an example, the prevalence of Zoom meetings and gatherings at home or in the workplace, which were so evident during the pandemic, will continue to influence future library spaces. Many users still do not have a computer or internet access in their home to conduct conversations and will need these computer technologies in small room settings in a library. So this is what we call the hybrid approach to facilities, which will also apply to library services so that users will feel comfortable in using the library, both physically in the library and from their own home or place of work. And then finally, there's the impact of the pandemic on our workforce. The feelings of isolation, anxiety, fear of losing one's, one's job that are evident in the general population also affect the library's workforce. The staff will need special attention and assurances that they continue to be a valued and essential part of the library. And in addition, remote work um, will be probably continued in the future. We, we have it now in many, many cases. And I think it's shown that, um, that it does, it does uh, pr produce results. That productivity has been increased in some areas. The morale of the employees have, has improved. And in the old days, well, remote work was never really considered for library work because normally you have to be on site to, to serve your patrons. But now I think we will see much more remote work in our libraries and in our societies. And we do have to be careful though, because the downside to remote work is that people are not connected to their colleagues to their work site. So we'll have to put measures in place really to make them feel part of the team still. So while I could go on with further examples um, of the, how the library will look, I would like to conclude just by making a few points. First, we'll be looking at a digital first environment. Digital will be the default. This will increasingly happen in all areas of work in a library from collections, to services, to spaces, and to communication internally and externally. Second, access to information will be less restrictive, at least for some particular areas of common interest or urgency, like health or climate change. The larger population will not accept anything less given the lack of information and the lack of authentic information that was available during the pandemic. Misinformation, disinformation, outright false claims were being widely spread online to the detriment of people's health and sanity. And I think libraries will play a large role in offering access to the most up-to-date and authoritative information available for their users. Third, the word hybrid will be used much more often, whether in describing the digital or print service the libraries provide, in how library conferences will be held in the future and how in how our workforce will perform their duties, be it from a remote site or physically in the library. Fourth, 
Libraries have always been held in high esteem by our users. We are one of the most trusted institutions in the world. The post-pandemic library will continue to build on that trust by listening to and responding to user needs that have been changed by the pandemic. And finally, remember the word accelerate. The world will be changing very fast and very soon. And as we all reassess who we are and what we can offer in a post-pandemic society. So hang on to your hats. When I became IFLA president 10 years ago, uh, I would travel to many countries and meet librarians, politicians, journalists. And the first question I usually was asked was, will the book survive? And I would answer, of course. Now, with so many negative impacts caused by the pandemic on the global society, the question may be asked, will the library survive? And you will all, I know, answer, of course. The world would be in much worse shape without a library, a welcoming space to interact with information and with each other in the spirit of social justice and equity. So we have a very bright future. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Ingrid. Um, I think you, you put a light to um, many different aspects touching from um, open access, copyright, misinformation, and of course, uh, the role of libraries. And I think this eternal question, um, since the, the technology uh, became so, so strong, make her presence so strong, um, will libraries survive? And I think this is, uh, this, this is vital. Um, uh, I have a question. Um, you uh, you live in a in a in a, in a big country with many libraries and a huge library tradition. How did um, uh, the government uh, deal uh, with um, the libraries and uh, the services the libraries provided and keep on providing you to 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 people to the Canadians uh, during this period? I think that the governments in general, there's many levels of government and they, they direct different libraries, the public libraries and the academic libraries. I think they have been supportive, um, but that doesn't mean there won't be difficulties and perhaps budget cuts in the future. Um, I think governments are under intense pressure to offer the immediate services related to medicine, related to health, related to social being. Um, and libraries never get that top priority. And I, I think that's not just only in Canada, but, but elsewhere as well. So we still have to continue to advocate for the role that libraries play. And so far, I mean, we haven't had huge closures or anything. Certain, for example, in a public library, branches have been closed. Uh, staff have been laid off, but we expect that we will be able to reintegrate them in the future. So I think that that feeling of trust that the public has in libraries, I don't think they'll allow, the public will allow governments to really uh, make libraries disappear completely. So I think we're, I think we're, I'm looking at it very positively. Okay, and I have a, a question from Afi Issa Taylor, um, a colleague of ours. Uh, during, so Afi asked ask you, um, during these times, how can libraries serve those who are not online? There are ways that libraries have done that. I, mean, I think of public libraries where we've had examples of uh, the books going to going to the people rather than people coming to a physical site. I mean, we've, you know, we've you always had bookmobiles and I think the mobile aspect of delivering information and material is very strong. That will continue. Um, I, I've seen libraries co collaborate with, for example, food banks. Um, there are food banks where um, library spaces can be used for people to come and pick up you know, food, but also they put librarians put some books into that the package as well. So I think there are different innovations that have taken place, and, and I really respect them. I think they're they're very innovative and and can be useful for for our communities, and they are useful. 
yeah, uh, and it's it's the food and it's 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 the book which is the food for thought. So Fantastic. yeah, <laughs> so this is uh, this is very innovative and I think very practical because many people, especially lonely people and elderly people, they needed uh, this kind of delivery, you know, mm -hmm. to 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 their homes. So Ingrid, thank you very much again. Of course, we will be back because um, at the end, after the end of um, uh, the speeches of each one of our speakers, we're going to have an open discussion uh, with um, the four of them. Uh, but, and um, uh, I would like to repeat, as I wrote also in chat, please feel free to ask any question to um, each one of our speakers uh, because there will be five minutes um, uh, for, uh, especially for uh, questions and answers after the end of um, uh, the speech. Thanks again, Ingrid. And now from Canada, we are moving uh, to Germany and uh, to, to Claudia, uh, Claudia Lux. Uh, What's first to say about Claudia? Claudia Lux is um, a, an honorary professor at Berlin School of Library and Information Studies, uh, Humboldt University in Berlin, and a consultant for library and information institutions. Uh, Claudia, of course, served and herself as president of IFLA, of International Federation of Library Association and Institutions, uh, from 2007 till 2009 and developed the library on the agenda theme. I think um, a theme always modern uh, to strengthen the librarians advocating competencies. She was the chair of the German Library Association, the president of the umbrella organization and active in many different advisory boards, both in Germany but also worldwide, as for an example, the Bill and Melinda Foundation. From uh, five years, 2012 till 2017, she was the project director of the Qatar National Library, an amazing library, I can tell by myself because I have visited the library twice, and fully responsible to initiate, set up and develop the concept budget, staff, collections, and services of the most innovative national library in the Gulf region. Prior to Qatar, she was uh, the general director of Central and Regional Library uh, in Berlin for over 15 years, and she led the process to unify the libraries of East and West Berlin to one powerful, very powerful, I must say, library organization. And for six years, 1991 to 1997, she was director of the Senate Library in Berlin. Prior, she studied her library career in the East Asian Department of the State Library in Berlin in 1986. She has degrees in social sciences and library sciences and a PhD in Chinese um, studies. She has published um, books on China and libraries and many articles on different aspects of advocacy, information literacy, library management and library architecture. Uh, Claudia, it is a great pleasure and a great honor to have you here. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Tonya. And I'm very, uh, very happy to be here and uh, thank you that I can join in into this discussion. And I just have to see. So. Um, yes, uh, I think a lot what Ingrid said uh, is exactly the same in, in Germany and in Europe. And uh, what we are doing and uh, what we now try is to fight the disaster. And uh, I think it's very important um, to take the change, the change that is uh, coming here uh, and uh, that will affect all of us. Um, the libraries in the post-COVID environment 
uh, as Ingrid said already, and uh, I also have the feeling we don't know exactly when this post-COVID uh, time will really start. Uh, here in Germany, we are just in the fourth wave, um, and it's terrible high uh, in the moment. And um, uh, we don't we, we don't have a lockdown, but um, it's not easy. Uh, to think that there will be anything like uh, it was before. And I doubt it. I doubt that it will be before. I think we will, our life have to be, has to be more careful. And uh, even if everyone in the, in the whole world will be, uh, will be vaccinated, it will still uh, take more time and um, it is, uh, it is a difficult time, but whatever. Uh, something, something very special happened during this time, especially to libraries. Uh, we have a, a faster digital development in libraries in Germany. Uh, we have IFLA conference online this year. Uh, we are now talking here together and I doubt uh, this would happen if uh, this uh, would not be the pandemic uh, situation. So we are coming closer in a digital way, uh, which we, I think have never thought of, or we were thinking maybe one day that it would be, could be like this, but um, it is uh, pretty different from maybe what we, uh, what we thought uh, in the beginning, because now uh, we really do much more with the Zoom and with everything. So the life in this has changed. And if I remember, um, I, there was one day, I think last year, uh, I could join meetings all around the globe. On one day, I was in Seoul, in Venice and in Halle. Uh, it's incredible, yeah? So um, it's something new, it's something wonderful, I feel. Um, and it's always that there is something bad, something good, I mean, in every bad thing. And so in the pandemic, there, uh, there are pros uh, and cons, but these pros are really very exciting, uh, I feel. Um, and I don't know, but if you remember, there was a trend report in 2013, quite a long time ago. And what we said there in the first was new technologies will both expand and limit who has access to information. An ever expanding digital universe will bring a higher value to information literacy skills, such as basic reading and competence with digital tools. And you can look around and you see many more people who have just learned this during the pandemic. Uh, it's really, uh, very special, even those who were maybe excluded before, uh, many of them uh, had the chance to start with it. We uh, brought with a, with a social responsibility organization, we brought uh, iPads into uh, uh, a home for, for um, elderly and they started to connect with their um, with their families uh, as they were not allowed to connect with anyone in person so there is a, there is a lot of change in, in this way and um, the uh, I think the trend report which is so funny was uh, really seeing a trend which now happened even more faster uh, through the pandemic. Um, even the greatest lockdown, electronic access to databases at the university where they were functioning well and students who were writing their thesis, even that they had more time, uh, they could use it and uh, they, they um, accepted to have this, mat uh, this material and to, to find more. And it was more open. As Ingrid said, we had uh, more possibilities to have open access uh, to some of the material which are normally behind paywalls. Um, I doubt it will be so easy to keep that, but um, let's talk about that later. Um, in the Humboldt University, we even uh, got uh, additional money to offer laptops to students who, with low income who were not allowed, who were not able to buy it themselves so that they can keep up learning. And the professors, they changed their full teaching program into online courses. First, just the talk and the slides and so, and then developing interactive discussions. 
as in my session, there were students and uh, in the middle of the session, they discussed on, um, on neutrality, uh, neutrality of libraries. And it, uh, they were themselves, because they were together in the room, they felt like they were in the real room. So for some people, like for these young students, it's not a difficulty to have this hybrid environment. Uh, it's easy for them. It's more difficult for the elderly and for some other people, maybe. Uh, there are always some who, who cannot align with it. But for most of the students, uh, it was very easy going. And uh, when we discussed this in, in Humboldt University, uh, it was very clear we are not going back to the normal courses in library school as before. We are, we are for sure, we are staying hybrid. And, uh, and this is also a new quality that the course will stay hybrid and more courses will stay hybrid uh, in the future. And that is the first change, a pro, which comes out of this pandemic and will stay after the pandemic. And um, for, uh, let, let me look at the, even the, the trench report, the, the number, uh, number two in the trench report. Will you ever need to remember anything ever again? It's about the global learning and exactly what happens now. Online education, they said, will democratize and disrupt global learning. The rapid global expansion in online education resources will make learning opportunities more abundant, cheaper and more accessible. There will be increased value on lifelong learning and more recognition of non-formal and informal learning. And exactly this happened during the pandemic. And uh, there were many more courses were, were put online. It was uh, this kind of discussion uh, put online. You were, it was accessible. Look at YouTube, what you find there in the moment on all the different courses. Uh, there was a, a big development even before, but I think especially during the pandemic, it has increased. And, uh, and this is another pro for the crisis. Uh, so what is important is that we have to advocate that this will stay afterwards. So advocate for hybrid teaching in library schools, and we need support from the government for this because it's not that you can just do hybrid courses. You need a special technology. You need more kind of technology uh, to, to be, uh, to be um, in a good state for those who are attending in person and those who are out there, that they don't see the, the professor from the back, but they can also see him from the front. And uh, that all this has to be very different. Um, uh, it has uh, changed. It's not a, a, a status quo of the, of the current uh, situation. Uh, there need to be a development and we need more money from the state exactly for this. But the cons of the pandemic is that there is no money. Especially now in the moment from the pandemic, Germany, they spent 67 billion euro already in, two, in this year. They have, and they have a minus, no, they have, they spent more. They have a minus of 67 billion in, this, in the state account. And that means that in the future, uh, because during the, during the pandemic and then after the shutdown, small and medium businesses were supported and big companies like Lufthansa uh, were supported by the state. There were no flights at all. And then the employees to soften the negative impact, uh, they also uh, got support. Uh, and in addition, the, now we get a new government after Angela Merkel, and then uh, they also have the idea and it's important to spend money on digitization and on green energy. Uh, so if you see all this, what is very clear and what the Library Association already tells everybody, uh, it will be a very hard financial time when we come out of this a very hard starting from next year. And it will be a cut, especially for cultural and educational institutions, because it's more easy to cut them than to cut others. And we are, we are expecting this for the next years, but uh, we are not agreeing to it. We have to fight it. And um, so when it, 
affected uh, the libraries. Uh, like here in the, in the third place of the Technical Uni uh, University Library in Berlin, uh, you, can, you can say that uh, uh, they were not allowed, they are not allowed to, to enter like this they had before. Uh, but in the digital way, we have difficulties. We are not allowed to, to give all those digital copies of library material in interlibrary loan. Uh, we are, there are too many restrictions still there. So uh, when it's come to, the, uh, to this uh, next stage, we, we cannot wait. We have to advocate now that there will be more possibilities to share digital copies of library material in the interlibrary loan. Um, and this is, uh, and the, the pandemic shows, I think the pandemic shows exactly that we need a better copyright law in whole Europe uh, with more limitations and exceptions for libraries. And uh, if we are not allowed to send these copies, articles to students uh, in, in this new digital environment um, and researchers uh, have difficulties in this time of uh, COVID, it is no longer acceptable. Uh, so, so not only in, in, in WIPO, but also all over in all the, the, the countries of the European Union, we need to advocate for limitation and exceptions for library. I think we are in a new stage. It's a very important part. We can showcase what happens when we don't have it through the pandemic. And uh, it's a very good moment, I think, to start an intensive um, advocating uh, 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 an intensive advocating uh, on these topics, uh, on the copyright to topics especially. Uh, I don't think it will come automatically. I think after, after the pandemic, everything will be more, uh, they will try to restrict more and it will be coming more, to be more restriction uh, again. And I think uh, it's very important that we prepare for it and, and uh, act on it. Um, so, uh, so that is, uh, and the, on the other way, we also need to advocate for support of libraries in all because uh, for, the, for the cultural, for the other, um, uh, for the other parts, for the culture, uh, they all want to have money after, after this situation. But I think library, it's always my, uh, my argument that the libraries, uh, there, there are reasons why you spend your money on the libraries because we can offer theater, we can offer music, we can offer film, we can offer uh, everything for children, uh, for adults, for the elderly, for, um, uh, for research. And uh, that is why I think we should be at least the first uh, in every uh, recovering uh, of the pandemic. And uh, the, what was or it was already talked about the third place, which was empty, the empty third, uh, third place, uh, which is our new way to, uh, to bring people together, uh, to, um, to have them uh, uh, served. So what is so important is, and what we were just starting is uh, to advocate for free Wi-Fi and digital services in all public libraries. I think we need the digital services, even if people cannot come to the library, but it's even more important that we have free Wi-Fi. So especially in this time when there are limited access to the, to the library so that those people who don't have this access at home, that they can use it in the library and you know it from all the libraries all over the world and how important this is uh, uh, for people. And there is, uh, there were, during the pandemic, there were activities here from the, uh, from the state, there was some support of libraries in the, on the countryside, that they could uh, change their digital services that they can, can uh, could not change, but uh, even develop, they didn't have any, they don't have Wi Fi. So, so uh, it's not that in Germany, uh, in all countryside, all country libraries or uh, libraries, uh, and, and smaller communities, they are all with free Wi Fi, and, and great digital services. So, uh, but this has to come and this is now expanding. And in the moment when it's expanding, we have to be very clear that we have to advocate for a free, that it will stay for free Wi-Fi in the future and the digital services of all public libraries. 
Um, in addition, uh, we, we had this situation that in the libraries, uh, we have offered our ebooks. Uh, during the pandemic was great. Last, I, I saw some of the, the um, uh, activities of uh, libraries uh, in some states of Germany that they come together to build new consortium to get more ebooks, especially also for public libraries. But the public libraries, they still have a big, big problem in Europe. Uh, and uh, especially also in Germany, uh, we are not allowed to buy each any ebook, all ebooks we want. Uh, we are restricted to those uh, where there are where the publishers offer licenses. And uh, I think even there, and again, the pandemic shows that this cannot stay like this. Uh, the pandemic shows exactly that people need the bestsellers. They want to read all this, and it will. Uh, and it will be one of the tasks, I think, also a task to start now to advocate for access to ebooks, the right to e-read as uh, Europe has done it, uh, and to be able at least to have better licenses to offer everything what is uh, online also to the, uh, to the uh, users of our public libraries. Um, uh, Okay, uh, sometimes we see how to fight the disaster uh, may take uh, to big changes. Um, disasters change political attitude. Uh, it doesn't come from itself. We still have to do something for it, but we have examples from Germany. After the fire in the famous Anna Amalia Library in Weimar, a symbol of the German classics, where Johann Wolfgang von Goethe was a librarian, Librarians could convince politicians for a library law and for a special program for preservation of, uh, of written cultural assets. Uh, and we attained financial support and it's still ongoing, the financial support, and we are still trying to, to get this also in the next years. Uh, but it's, it's important that uh, only because of this fire, this suddenly happened. And what I think this time of disaster, we now want to achieve free Wi-Fi, hopefully free Wi-Fi uh, in all public libraries, especially on the countryside where it's still missing. And we want to achieve more limitations of the copyright and access to eBooks on the choice of the librarian for the users and not restricted by the publishers. Uh, so there is not much money left, but these things, has nothing to do with additional money from the state in reality. It's much more easier uh, to support this. And for the people's mind, education and culture, uh, this is needed first. So to support libraries now and after the pandemic is the most important task any country can do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia. Um, I think um, um, it was it was very, how to say it, to the point and very practical. Uh, also, to uh, to put the light on the role of decision makers uh, and as they have to do with libraries, and of course uh, the big issue of copyright. Uh, I know that uh, IFLA itself um, has uh, long uh, negotiations with uh, WIPO about this matter, but um, I think that a solution is more than needed uh, because of the pandemic uh, for uh, a broader access, uh, you know, to, to books and of course to, uh, to, to e-books. And talking about decision makers and politicians, I would like at this point to mention that also uh, our Minister of Education uh, were administratively all the public libraries and uh, the, the big public libraries and the National Library belong, would love to be here with us today, but um, because uh, she had um, a long time prearranged pre uh, obligations, she, she couldn't be here with us, uh, but she, she is a person who has a uh, deep um, interest and uh, care for, uh, for 
for libraries. And I hope we will have here with uh, us in the next event that we're going to, to organize. Um, Claudia, a, a question. Um, we all know that uh, you are very internationally involved with um, uh, almost all kinds of libraries. You were, um, you were the mother, let's say, of the new building of the National Library. You, uh, you, worked, you have worked in a, in a public library, in a university library, and of course you were IFLA president. Uh, if um, uh, you, you were about to, to name the biggest um, uh, positive outcome of the pandemic for libraries, especially in Germany, which, which one would be this? Uh, I would say the, the biggest outcome is um, that the users want us. It's so clear. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's no matter if it's university libraries or if it is public libraries and librarians were fighting from the uh, first lockdown that there should not be a lockdown on libraries. Uh, and here in Berlin, uh, we even had the possibility to have bookstores open because um, uh, the government of Berlin here, the, the government of the, the state of Berlin, uh, they said uh, people need to read during this time. And especially the same we were our arguments for uh, the libraries. And I think that was very, very good that it was achieved that then uh, slowly, slowly it could open again. Um, I think, uh, we are not working for ourselves. You know this. We uh, we are service of our uh, users, uh, uh, those who who want us, those who need uh, the libraries. And 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 when we fight for anything, if if we fight for free free Wi-Fi or uh, we fight for limitation and exception in copyright, it's not for for ourselves. It's it's really it's for a whole bunch of people. Uh, those who study, those who, who teach, those who, um, uh, who um, just um, uh, want to use the library for their emotional uh, good times. Uh, and especially in a pandemic, it's so important. A library is a key to many problems, I think. Yeah, yeah, we are we are the necessary good. We are the necessary good, not yeah. the necessary bad. And um, of course, as Ingrid uh, has mentioned, uh, we are the accurate and reliable social partners uh, for for people's life. And uh, at this point, um, I would like also to mention that uh, we have many many participants over than 100, 104 uh, uh, right now attendees, I mean. And um, I, I can see um, and now and before while we, you were speaking and members of the current uh, governing board as my colleague Jonathan from Mexico, Joe, um, and um, our uh, uh, treasurer, Perry, Mor Perry Moray was just a, a minute ago. So, um, uh, we have three out of 11 uh, governing board member and myself four. So I, I think the one third of the governing board of the IFLA governing board is, is here and um, it, we are all excited with all our um, attendees to, to listen to you. Thank you, uh, Claudia. We will be back Thank to you. you. Thank you so much. And now I'm, um, uh, I'm going to present another distinguished and prominent lady coming from South Africa. And we are all having our minds, these two wonderful WLACs in, um, in, in Durban and in Cape Town, one of my favorite cities, I must tell you, um, I must confess, Ellen. And it's Ellen Ties, Ellen Ties, the Senior Director of Library and Information Services at Stellenbosch University, holding um, a, an honorary degree from the University of Western Cape and a Master of Philosophy in Science and Technology Studies from Stellenbosch University. Among other very notable leadership uh, roles, Ellen has served as um, uh, the first president of the Library and Information Association of South Africa, the famous Liaza, 
from 1998 to 2002. And of course, uh, she is also a past president um, of um, IFLA, uh, known as um, IFLA for the two year, for years 2009 uh, through 2011. Uh, she has just started a second two years term as chair of the uh, FIFA. Uh, one of the most important, I think, for all during all these times, and I think also uh, for the future advisory committees of IFLA, because it has to do with the freedom of access to information, uh, the main uh, topic of Claudia and, of, of course, of the Ingrid, and um, the, the freedom of expression. And she is a recipient of several um, awards, for her distinguished leadership and outstanding contributions to uh, librarianship, including honorary membership of Lianza, and of course herself, she is an honorary IFLAM fellow. Helen has published various articles in professional journals, and she is a regular speaker uh, at national and international conferences, seminars, and symposia. Helen, the floor is yours. Good evening um, from, from Stellenbosch in, in South Africa. Um, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation um, to share uh, tonight uh, the, this panel uh, and to contribute uh, to, to this session. So thank you very much for the, uh, for the invitation. Um, and uh, it has already been um, so fruitful to, to listen uh, to you and, of course, to Ingrid and, and Claudia. And I think I must just thank you for just bringing us together like this. <laughs> uh, so so, so uh, Claudia and, and Ingrid had touched on, on quite a bit um, that, uh, that I would also uh, wanted uh, to, to say, but, but I, 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 I'm just going to have a slightly different approach um, also, just speaking generally about uh, how how we how we got to to where we are, um, then I want to to focus on on two challenges that uh, that I think uh, will definitely be the the two that we focus on. And again, Claudia and Ingrid had actually mentioned those in terms of what we need to address going forward. Um, then I'd like to uh, talk briefly about. What, what have we learned uh, during the pandemic? And then moving forward, um, some of the things that I would like to, to highlight. So uh, we, we heard uh, a few words, um, uh, uh, two words that I in particularly want to, that I will also um, mention tonight. And that is uh, about, uh, from Ingrid, the acceleration. Um, and then as Claudia said, you know, also already from the trend report, uh, you know, that uh, how this had already come to fruition uh, during the last two years. And then also this whole thing about trust and this uh, libraries re being regarded as, uh, as, as a safe haven and how libraries are trusted. Um, and, 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 and I will touch on that. So, 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 so although COVID-19 was um, a shock <laughs> to the world, um, uh, and when we think about innovation and technological advances, the, the world was already in the midst of a technological revolution, of course, the fourth industrial revolution prior to COVID-19. And, and parallel to this revolution was, for example, and I will speak more from an academic library perspective, uh, but a lot of what I will say will, of course, also apply to other types of library. So, so parallel to this revolution was this gradual shift already uh, by universities towards online teaching, learning and research. And of course, with libraries playing a central role, support role in that. So uh, to effectively deliver on their mandate, many libraries deplo deployed uh, advanced innovative technologies such as robotics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the use of data analytics to inform some of their decisions. So although COVID-19 has had a negative effect generally, it has also brought further opportunities for innovation. As I said, academic libraries shifted their services online in, you know, when we heard there's going to be a lockdown, 
um, it was actually, you know, just all that we know that we have to go, we're going to work remotely. Uh, we will work from home, but um, because we've already have most of our resources online in any case. So, but we have had to do that at an accelerated pace um, in line with the universities. The jury is still out there as to whether this crisis will lead to another technological revolution in academic libraries or in libraries, uh, 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 in all libraries, where the application of advanced technologies become the norm rather than the exception. So the year 2020 and 2021, the years will forever be remembered as a period when individuals, organizations, countries were challenged to cope in and adapt to a vastly different, different world brought about by COVID-19. However, having previously embraced new and advanced technologies, libraries rose to the challenge by providing online library services to support their clients. In doing so, libraries who have always been heroes of their communities and their users have actually become superheroes. And, um, However, as we have adjusted to this new normal and having learned new skills and accumulated new experiences, having seen how libraries and librarians stood up and shown their mettle during the pandemic, we have experienced many challenges. In the interest of time, I'm just going to highlight two challenges. The one, as we've heard around access to information and resources. Faced with the restrictions on movements of people, in the closure of libraries and institutions, it was no surprise that we saw the unprecedented need for digital content, books, resources, as well as for training and support. Our clients have actually said they need us now more than ever to help them to successfully access our resources. Uh, where it was taken before for granted, it's there and I will sort of need it when I need it, or I can always go to the library and somebody would help me. So secondly, as we know, many publishers initially at in the early part of the pandemic provided free and or expanded access to their content um, to support students and academics who had to work from home, as Claudia has mentioned. So in South Africa, and I'm sure this is the case in many other uh, developing countries and certainly for in many parts of uh, the African continent, uh, where we also have very high data costs. Many students, although we've had all of these resources, students had to go home, some of them in rural areas, they didn't have access, they could can't afford data. So uh, an innovation, many universities had to provide students with data bundles and also laptops. Again, as Claudia had mentioned that they also had to do. Um, libraries, what did we do? We're also aware that the high cost of data, and even though they got um, data bundles from the universities that the universities paid for, we also found ways to how can we create data light uh, resources so that students can use less data uh, in order for them to access, you know, depending also, of course, what day of the night. We created new guides, um, uh, lib guides on how to access, for example, COVID um, um, uh, resources, you know, during this time, especially the free resources. Um, also, um, and Ingrid mentioned this, for example, uh, we realized also there was a high demand for access to a research output um, on COVID uh, related research. And we also know many publishers, they actually, um, uh, uh, removed, um, you know, the whole process in terms of peer review so that they can publish this material as quickly as possible. And libraries could make this research also available through our uh, uh, institutional repository so that more and more people can actually get access to it. There was a huge demand for this and libraries had played a major role in that. Um, so, but, you know, as I said, there was this unprecedented um, a need of, to access digital resources because people couldn't actually physically visit the library. And as Claudia had said, however, acquiring eBooks and e-textbooks specifically posed an even greater challenge. So many publishers do not make um, textbooks, uh, e-textbooks um, available uh, for purchase by libraries at all. 
in those who do charge sky high prices. This is being challenged. It should be challenged, continue, and libraries should not accept that. So there are initiatives, as we've heard in Europe, the UK, the US, and IFLA's uh, Copyright and Legal Matters Committee has also been doing surveys, finding out what is happening in other parts of the world and how can we deal with this together to challenge governments, in fact, have also started to challenge publishers uh, with regard to this. So libraries, as we've heard from, from Ingrid, um, are well positioned to further develop open access initiatives of support of building trusted knowledges of an information society. Another big challenge was the other pandemic, the pandemic that of fake news. And of course, we know the definition, fake news refers to the invention and distribution of false and incorrect information as credible information. Um, uh, Waddle uh, states that it involves misinformation, which is intentional, mis unintentional mistakes such as inaccurate photo captions data. And we know how this had impact on, on uh, the pandemic and in terms of what libraries also had to deal with. Malinformation, deliberate publication of private information towards whatever ends, and disinformation, fabricated or deliberately manipulated video or information. As we know, uh, there had been many webinars and discussions on this. IFLA have held many webinars on this, but I would like to focus just very briefly on the response from library bodies and the role that libraries plays, uh, play, played in empowering users to at least identify this fake news. And um, in response to this, for example, we know there's IFLA's How to Spot Fake News infographic, the American Library Association had libraries can play a role in not only showing the spread of the disease, but also the spread of misinformation. SILIP in the UK had referred librarians to the coronavirus in misinformation tracker provided by NewsGuard. EFLIA um, condemns the prevalence of fake news about the virus in the continent and charges African librarians with disseminating and providing credible information to correct myths and disinformation about the virus and repackage information into local indigenous languages. Um, there were things from the Nigerian Library Association, from Liasa, and many libraries have played a huge role in trying to address this whole issue around uh, fake news. In South Africa, for example, many of the academic libraries had um, made sure that they provide quality and incredible a credible information about COVID-19. Um, we had made sure that we sensitize users to the harmful effects of fake news, e.g. through our lip guides, conferences, and webinars. So how did, can we and did we empower these users? Information and media literacy serves as a primary weapon against misinformation. Educating people improves their deductive reasoning in order for them to sift through information and determine fact from fiction. Through information and media literacy programs, we've managed to transfer our information literacy skills to many clients, and many of our clients were then able to identify and locate quality, credible, and trustworthy information. So through these empowerment programs, we will ensure that clients are much better equipped to fight misinformation in all its forms. So although we know fake news will not perish, as librarians, we have the know-how and the tools to neutralize its worst effects to the society, mainly through our empowerment programs. Knowledge remains and is the biggest weapon one can possess against the fake news pandemic. So very briefly, what have we learned? Libraries have overcome the, challenge, the challenges of COVID-19 in a big way. The evolving world and the placement of libraries in society has become central. The concept libraries tend and continues to be, and I hope this will change this probably more than ever before, that we tend to look inward. But as we've heard from our colleagues today, we are, this, the pandemic had forced us to look outward. We are now in outward facing libraries that is bringing the library to where the users are, when the users need it. We've learned that the human element will always play an integral part in the services we provide. And of course, this, this is nothing new. 
reskilling is going to continued reskilling is going to be important and will do so. The COVID, the pandemic has significantly accelerated the pace of change and ushered in new ways of work that will shape the future of work. Librarians demonstrated their agility and adaptability. And one thing that is that we know for sure, sustained change is here to stay. So moving forward, as I said, the requirement of human interaction will remain high. The increase is will be in the value proposition of libraries. For example, again, to counter fake news and all this news that we get everywhere for, it is important, the value that we bring by providing quality metadata. The employee wellness will be critical. Staff need to feel safe and protected. What we've learned also is that, and we've seen this, the low return on investment probably of low use print collection is something libraries will have to address after COVID-19. And perhaps our print collections need to be reconsidered. So instead of returning to normal, librarians will be returning to a new normal where, for example, in-person classes and service interactions may be impossible or no longer preferred, again, as we heard from um, Claudia. So Lorraine Herricom from the University of Texas, Austin, at our recent Stellenbosch University Library Symposium gave the following advice. We must fall forward. It is impossible to be always right, but keep on trying and keep on moving forward. Libraries have a great advantage. We have trust capital. People trust libraries and see us as a safe place. We must use this capitalize on it to create a sustainable way to move forward. So finally, it is still difficult for us to predict how libraries will change. However, one thing is certain, libraries will continue to grow and change to meet the needs of their patrons. And the current environments actually provide us that opportunity to scale up and diversify, and diversify our services even more that we've done in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen, so much for your enthusiastic and um, positive um, speech. And also it was, it was a, a speech that made all of us, I think, um, thinking uh, more, how to say it, with self-confidence of uh, who we are as um, people working in the libraries and of course, what the institutions that we are serving really are and their added value uh, to, uh, to the society, but also the added value for themselves, uh, for the institutions and for the people working uh, to, to, uh, to, to these institutions. I know that um, uh, you have another ob obligation and you have to leave. So a very quick uh, question um, to you. Uh, you talk um, about agility and adaptability to, for, for the librarians. Uh, having in our mind that, um, as Claudia has already mentioned for Germany, and I think it will be um, a worldwide phenomenon about uh, perhaps uh, budget cuttings and about a different picture um, of our, our our world after the the pandemic. How do you think that this adaptability, especially for the young librarians, for the young professionals, uh, to the new environment, can become? I, I definitely think as we uh, embrace. Uh, and as we have in the past, um, and now with the new technologies. So that adaptability, and especially with young librarians, we cannot continue to adopt these new technologies. We have to bring in artificial intelligence. It's going to improve, you know, a lot of the services that we have, and then we can utilize, you know, the, the human power that we have, and, uh, you know, um, use them now to rather provide the, uh, the human interaction of the services that we have to provide. So it is about in terms of how we would be able to do that and adapt that and it's the only way again. Um, and I think um, others, uh, Claudio had mentioned that it's not about necessarily that we need more money. 
It's about, you know, how best can we actually utilize what we have, use the technologies to improve what we're doing. Why do we get robots that can pack away, you know, or reshell the books um, um, and um, invest the money in there um, and rather use these uh, new innovative young creative librarians. And I've seen this, we are now only appointing them in their, in their 20s. <laughs> and they bring so much to the library and they we don't need to ask them twice. They just come up with these new ideas. So um, I think that is the way forward. Let's use these technologies to improve what we're doing and use uh, the, the creativity of these um, young librarians in terms of how can they and who understand much better how people use this um, and um, and libraries will 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 thrive. Uh, I do think we, we will thrive. Okay, and I have a question from um, our colleague Gail Wright. Um, ask from you a practical advice on the updating role of, of librarians. Okay, the the the, the I assume she means you know in terms of. Um, uh, li librarians that uh, who probably needs to to update their their, their skills I, I think so i guess um, so. yes 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 uh, uh, a practical um a practical example would probably you know we know if there are many training online training courses today that are being offered uh, there are many programs and that is the best way, you know, in which we can continue to keep um, updating. Um, and of course, the, the library schools, you know, they really also need to offer a lot more of these new courses. But the best thing is, um, you know, to, to check. We have created in our library, for example, a lip guide, we, uh, which uh, uh, a guide specifically for library staff. We continuously update all the online courses that becomes available. We support our librarians. Many of these courses are completely free. Um, and we continuously, you know, as part of the program, development program for the year, they, we actually ask that they need to take one or two of these courses. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, that's probably the, the best practical example on, on what, what I say we, you, you, could, you can do. It's all about education, as we used to say. Uh, so thank you so much. I, 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 I really would like to, to thank you deeply. I think it's, a, it's one of the rare chances that we have the three of you together, uh, ladies, and I'm longing to see uh, you in person, face to face uh, in Dublin. And um, perhaps we will have the chance uh, to, to meet um, uh, again um, all together um, uh, before Dublin, uh, I mean virtually. So I say uh, we all say goodbye and thank you to Ellen. Of course, thank we you. will uh, continue to, uh, to, to our program, but thank you so much, um, Ellen, and many greetings to, to all uh, our South African and um, African uh, colleagues. Uh, deepest thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> so, and uh, last but not least, our Greek speaker, um, Anthi. Anthi Katsiriku, she is also a member of the General Council uh, for Libraries uh, in the Greek Ministry of Education. And of course, Anthi, she is the president uh, of the um, Association of Greek Librarians and Information Scientists. And he, she's a doctor, she has a PhD in, in library and information science and bachelor's de degree in political science. She's the director of the library of the University of uh, Piraeus. Uh, she was adjunct for, professor of the um, um, T of Athens, now it's renamed as the University of West Attica. Uh, for uh, nine years, and since 2017, she is the adjunct uh, professor at uh, the master courses of um, the Open University of Greece. Uh, she has organized the 20th conference of IATUR in the beautiful um, city of Hanya in Crete, um, and two IFLA satellite pre-conference meetings in Hanya 2010. 
uh, before the Milan um, IW Lacy and uh, in the University of Prius, uh, Greece in 2019, before um, our last face to face W L I C in Athens. Uh, since 2009, she, uh, she, is, uh, she is the co-chair of the uh, International Conference on Quantitative and Qualitative Methods, methods in Libraries, our well-known QQML, and she is the chief editor of the Open Access Scientific Journal, the QQML uh, e-journal. And she is the editor of scientific books of the publishers World Scientific and um, De Groyter, so, and has published scientific papers papers to the international journals of Elsevier, Emerald, and others. And of course, he is a member of IFLA, how, how it could be different, uh, IATU, ALA, and ACRL. So, uh, Anthe, the floor is yours. Anthe, you are muted. And see, you are muted. Turn on, turn on your mic, please. Uh, and see, um, uh, your mic now is, 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 is on, but perhaps you have uh, to, to raise up the volume of your sound, we can't hear you. Sorry, we can't hear you, but perhaps that um, our very sophisticated technician from the uh, Eugenides Foundation can help uh, Anthe. We can't hear you. Raise up the... the, the Isn't talking about the role of politicians, the role of funding, and the role of librarians themselves. So we have three important, let's say, elements uh, with two important players, the, the decision makers, politicians, and uh, the librarians. How we can strengthen this, this kind of relationship, but for the benefit of our libraries? Ingrid, if you, I know that you have such a long experience uh, and uh, we all have um, I, I admired so much what you, you have done and what, what you are still um, doing also in national and international level. So could you please uh, say a few words on that? See, because I think it's, it's really important. Yes, um, you know, Libraries don't exist on their own. They, they are responsible to higher beings, and some of those are governments, and some of those are private um, investors and things. So we have to, I think we need a better job of doing marketing and public relations of, of what we do. Um, I think many people, and I hate to say it, and it makes me sound very old, but many people think libraries lend books, and that's it. 
And, you know, we've gone so far beyond that. And I, I think we need to tell people, especially politicians, you know, what is the situation? Um, and me. how we are leading, how we are leading in the process of um, serving the public good. Yes, we can hear you. Oh. you and hear how we me serve? now? Yep. Yeah. Yes, we yes, can yes, hear yes. you. <laughs> okay. I think I asked a question, a question in the meanwhile. So let the Ingrid um, oh, fin yes, fin yes, finish her answer first, and then we will. You you have all the time, you know, to start and finish properly um, your presentation. Just Easy. a few. Yeah. Sorry. Just a few words, just to say we need to find allies in 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 our governments and in our partnerships and whoever we can get outside the library to 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 advocate on our behalf. We can advocate, but I think others need to do so as well. So what, wherever you find those allies in terms of users, perhaps users who have influence, I'm sure there are many politicians who use libraries, maybe not directly, but they might get access to information. They don't even know it comes from our libraries. So we need to get those people informed and do it through allies that we can we can get in our societies. Uh, good, and uh, Claudia, um, uh, let's say that we, we, we were both belonging to the same management and marketing section, yes. uh, uh, to, 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 to our common small family. So what is your approach on this? Yes, besides of marketing and everything uh, we do for public relations, I think what is very important, a librarian should be more interested in politics. They really should know how, should know how it functions uh, in their community, uh, on the higher level. Uh, so wherever that they are not like, I, I still feel that some are still blind. Uh, so who is really deciding about our money? It's good when it comes, but that's it. Uh, the directors, they know because they have to fight for it, but it should be a broader information. There should be broader knowledge about how politics uh, is functioning uh, and what advocating uh, in this uh, different, uh, different structures, uh, how, it, how it can be. It's not so difficult. It's not a, a, a secret science. It's uh, pretty open and there are many tools already how, how we can do it. Uh, so just uh, start and, and do it. I think it, uh, you can only be successful. Uh, there's nothing to lose. Absolutely. And it's not fiction science. It's, it's just a realistic approach. Yeah, so we, we have to get more, um, uh, how to say it, aware of what is going on. So thank you. And now um, we are eager to, uh, to, to hear from uh, Anthe. Anthe, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. For this invitation, uh, representing the Association of Greek li uh, Librarians and Information Scientists. Plain the words. The firm where the world is temporarily closed is a label uh, outside of a firm. And uh, I thought that uh, plain uh, in words, the firm seems uh, to reflect uh, the first impression we had uh, when uh, the lockdown was imposed. The very early decision was that uh, we should do our best to say against the situation and to continue life, not only everyday life, but the life itself. It was a challenge for us. As uh, every, uh, every, in the most places of the world, the libraries in Greece applied the hygiene uh, uh, rules and policies to protect good people. And from the very, very beginning, uh, staff in libraries were uh, well informed on uh, the updated legislation about measures against COVID, even on a daily basis sometimes. And uh, the, of course, the hygiene measures, measures as well as uh, the research results on uh, the disease. The first phase uh, was the period of lockdown when uh, everything uh, was closed. 
but the libraries uh, tried at least uh, to offer remote services. The second phase uh, was the period of the partial physical access. In Greece, the decision-making situations differentiated in three types. Greek government uh, made the decisions for academic, municipal, and national libraries. Uh, public authorities made the decision for public libraries and uh, the in-house uh, decision-making of parent organizations of, of, of the special and the research libraries. In second phase, the libraries decided the number of measures in order to permit the use of the indoor and the outdoor spaces as uh, everywhere. Uh, in his five uh, initiatives also uh, took uh, the organizations like uh, the Consortium of Greek Academic Libraries, HeLink, uh, had come up with a schedule of four phases to reopen in academic libraries. The association, uh, the previous uh, um, board, under the leadership of Alexandra Papazoglu, compiled the schedule for the libraries reopening, and uh, all the libraries adjusted their space to fulfill uh, the hygiene measures. COVID brought uh, para uh, paradigm shift in functioning of libraries. They perform three different approaches on how they manage the crisis and reflect the organizational level of them. The first uh, was the libraries with a passive approach have no specific plans for the crisis time. As a result, they shut down the library and stop all the services just to help reducing the spread of the disease. The second level uh, are the libraries uh, with uh, active practice that have alternative plans and are almost ready to react appropriately. They have some services to offer, for example, online services instead of face-to-face. -face. And uh, the third uh, level uh, where the, are the libraries with proactive attitudes are one step ahead having already prepared new creative services, for example, to start digital storytelling programs for the users or run virtual sessions. In that context, Greek libraries, according uh, to, for, uh, to, to their uh, uh, capacity, their staff, their uh, resources, uh, their technological infrastructure uh, offered or continued to offer uh, the following virtual access 24 days for uh, hours for seven days, web pages with enriched content, research resources and updated information on COVID 19, loan services of printed material by post to taxi or by appointment, scanning of a very limited number of pages of printed books on demand, reading clubs by video conferencing, remotely organized programs for kids and families, virtual projects and webinars, teaching programs for students and children, support online classes, e-books, e journals, digital and digitalized content available, organized guides to the users on how to use the library resources during the pandemic, information literacy programs through WebEx, Zoom, etc., and reference services online, support uh, through Skype, emails, telephone, social media, and ask, a li and ask librarian. Uh, Two collective uh, initiatives I'd like to refer, the National Library of Greece adjusted the program Turn the Page with public, uh, with public libraries to turn the page from the library at home so that uh, children from all over the country uh, could participate from their place. And uh, the Greek uh, Consortium of Academic Libraries, HeLink, uh, took from the first moment uh, the following initiatives. 
uh, supplies uh, scientific sources about COVID-19 from the journals uh, of international publishers. Uh, issues a schedule of four phases, how the academic libraries could reopen and they applied it, every library applied it. Issued guidelines to lecturers how to use the digital content aligned to the copyright law. Promotes the repository Calipos, which established in 2016 and contains open access digital review textbooks on every scientific discipline written by the Greek professors. The lockdown was the chance for students to use it more than ever. And Calipos uh, continues to enrich its uh, content and to increase its titles and continues to supply uh, the libraries and researchers, uh, 152,000 e-books and uh, 26,700 e-journals of the greatest international publishers. Among them, Science Direct, Springer, ACM, IEEE, and of course, the, uh, the open access ones, uh, DOAS, DOAB, and uh, other uh, open access databases. Digital libraries offer uh, more and more free content curating personalized collections so, so that people can theoretically continue to read and learn without disruption. As the demand for the credible uh, e-resources emerges, digital libraries have proved the vital pathways to high quality books, journals, and educational content. And uh, according to the IFLA manifesto, digital libraries has, have the mission to give direct access to information, uh, but the most important raise awareness about intellectual property rights, support the preservation of cultural heritage, and ensure that disadvantaged groups enjoy equity of access. What, what is the reality? Equal, uh, according to our uh, opinion, Closed, uh, the closed physical spaces abolish or decline the equal access to the information and knowledge for poor citizens. And this is a matter of democracy. There is lack of essential primary resources such as archives, objects, and manuscripts for research. There is the business models of e-books publishers don't serve libraries' needs because the prices are high, to buy and uh, the, the access is a uh, limited uh, time, limited period. The copyright issues are not solved yet. Poor digital content in Greek, either scientific or of general interest available. Fake news and misinformation techniques emerged. The students prefer hard copies. <laughs> Me too. Both citizens and students use more internet than before. And working models threaten the working conditions, work such as working hours, virtual work, decrease of salaries, etc. And all, all these matters. But what are the challenges? New business models for libraries and publishers. I, I think that uh, we set the negotiations in a new basis. New pattern for open access to change into real open and free source without payment. This is a, a serious problem for universities and the researchers. New models on scholarly communication. Uh, IPRE prints play more and more significant role. Institutional repositories are accepted as key factors of the publication process by the entire community. Libraries undertake the role of the publisher or could, be, uh, could undertake it. Authors and researchers present their research openly and community strengthen the path to new ways of publishing, evaluating, research, and measure its impact. That all of these guide to the new patterns of ranking the research scientists' academic departments. The content 
such as posters, data sets, software codes, working papers, presentation slides are available online and take their share in the evaluation. Change patterns of studying, flexibility on the reading, alternative bibliographies, images, audios, videos, games, tools <coughs> to learn and process, are used to the learning process. Use and edit the OCR sets of digital generated texts. New communication models between librarians, users, researchers, students, and citizens via Zoom meetings, virtual teaching, hybrid uh, conferences, and the use of social media, uh, YouTube, Pinterest, etc. Uh, the matter is uh, how effective and efficient are they indeed? Uh, if uh, they can uh, substitute uh, physical uh, presence or uh, their role, <coughs> sorry, or their role remain uh, complementary. New knowledge terms in, co in common use to provide valuable information and da data in this content context. Consortia and the network supported the library's members through interlibrary loan and document delivery. Innovative technologies, smartphones and mobile devices facilitate access digital and digital content. Library is going green. It is a matter of investigation if the digital content is free carbon dioxide emission and if uh, uh, we uh, decrease uh, the pollution uh, through uh, digital uh, solutions. And a new generation of users, students, employees, and learners uh, feel anxious in their isolation, didn't, didn't communicate and interact directly in person, but develop an increased rate, range of uh, transfer, transferable skills to design and deliver distance teaching, learning, access, working, and maybe entertaining. What's next? The libraries need to train their staff in skills to handle digital technologies and platform, as well as administrative adjustment is necessary to the new managerial environment. And to face fakes, librarians, must intensify the programs of media literacy and the fair use of information to the citizens to obtain critical thinking skills and manage to distinguish between the fake news and the true. The lessons learned. The library should compile an emergency management plan when their environment is in crisis to continue to meet the information needs of their users and to provide community sanctuary and support. The libraries have to go smart, explore new applications and devices that will add values to the information services without involving huge costs in the investments, quick retri retrieval known as QR codes attract young, young users and touch value to library services. Libraries also need to work closely to their users to innovate and collaborate with partners, libraries, stakeholders, vendors, publishers, and content providers to transform digitally and remain digitally connected in a more cost-effective and efficient way. They need to expand the, they need to expand their services compatibility to mobile apps in order to offer access catalogs, digital content, and knowledge uh, portals, as well as to deliver information to create awareness. Digital systems must uh, guarantee the content they host in eternity. The printed material is guaranteed. And open access must become more attractive with diverse access models and innovative procedures. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anthe. Um, thank you for, the, for this presentation. So you gave us um, an overall uh, picture of the of the um, uh, ongoing situation in Greece, 
uh, in Greek libraries, um, at least um, in, the, in the times of a pandemic. Um, you mentioned about smart libraries. My question is how library associations can become smarter? Library association will uh, uh, follow the, the paths of uh, today and uh, try to uh, perhaps uh, through uh, continuing education uh, programs to uh, organize uh, the, li the, li the librarian skills if they like and if uh, we, we think of it. We have no any project uh, just now. Okay, uh, so now I, I have one um, uh, question uh, for uh, Claudia, especially. So it is especially how it was the song. We all know the song, especially for you. So uh, Claudia, we have uh, a question from um, an attendee. What do you think about the future of printed books in libraries after COVID? Uh, okay. Um... I think it uh, there will be still printed books because there is a lot of material uh, which is in copyright and it's not digital and it's not uh, uh, in no other way accessible. Uh, however, and, and you can see for research, you still need printed books. I was just writing something and I had to, even during COVID, I had to go to the state library and so all these processes, uh, um, order it days before and then take it in the bucket and <laughs> take it out. Uh, so uh, I think there is still some need, but when you look of the those what is uh, of the citations, uh, it's getting less and less. So the digital material is much more um, cited and uh, especially the open access material is more cited. That is uh, clear. Uh, for for the normal development, I think um, there will be still printed books, uh, at least for my generation and maybe for the next generation. Um, I cannot promise for um, in 300 years or something if it's still the same format. Um, maybe the format is really different. Uh, maybe they, they love the printed books as uh, we love old codices or uh, <laughs> other... Um, nice material from uh, old Egypt and so on. So uh, we don't know how it will happen. At least uh, I think as it has a, a special practical value, um, it will still keep for some time. I think nobody who is listened today uh, to us uh, will have a problem uh, not to have access to printed books in libraries anymore. Thank you so much. And now I open the floor to for uh, for a, di a discussion with um, uh, the, the the four of you. And um, a question is: um, You uh, are all um, experienced in the library field, but we are all also users. So um, we we are talking about the COVID period and the, and the challenges that uh, libraries face in the COVID period. And um, as Ingrid mentioned, we, 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 we must think about the post-COVID period. And of course, also you, Claudia, uh, you referred a lot what may happen after, uh, for after this, uh, this uh, high-risk management period ends. Uh, talking generally about risk management, uh, what tips could you uh, give to um, librarians about how to deal with not only the this, this kind of pandemic of COVID-19, but also about high risks that may maybe appear in the near future um, in their professional life? Just tips. And Ingrid, let's hear from you, if you could, please. Um, if I could just start by adding to what Claudia said about printed books. Um, I remember at the university library, we asked first year students, um, you know, can we not have printed books anymore? And they 
absolutely said no, they prefer printed books. And I, I think Nancy said the same thing, you know, I, they'll still be there. Um, and so we have to plan for that hybrid world for quite a while for now. Um, tips, I think, um, again, as Amthi said, you know, uh, when I was director of the library, I, the disaster management plans or emergency plans, you, you didn't like to do them because they were all hypothetical. We said, oh, maybe we'll have a disaster. So let's do a plan. But it wasn't real. But now it's real. Like now we know <laughs> unexpectedly that disasters, epidemics can happen. And so I think those plans, those those constant thinking about not just today, but what could happen and how are we going to deal with it? I think that's really important for, for library directors to think about and the library staff as well. So, Thank you, Ingrid. Um, Anthe, uh, what's your tip? Yes, I agree. Uh, I mentioned that uh, in my speech that the, we must uh, compile uh, man crisis management plans, but uh, uh, these plans must uh, include scenarios. What everybody does uh, in, in which uh, circumstances. Uh, I, like, like, uh, like a Cheap, like an, an industry. Imagine an industry. If uh, a fire happens in, an, in a factory, everybody knows what to do as a role. So we have to, um, to create scenarios to be ready to, um, uh, to, to, to play the roles as a theatrical uh, play, I think, in order to be ready. Yeah, and in many times reality is um, far beyond even from imagination. Yes. So uh, when- Exactly, we... let me, Tonya, let me tell you. Yeah. I, had a, I had a master student and she worked on, um, on the disaster plans of national libraries all over the world for IFLA. And uh, not even, I think not even half of them, they have one. And those who have- they, I know. It's not actual. So, so I remember that in 2006, I made a pandemic plan for the Central and Regional Library in Berlin. I doubt that they even remembered it when it came because I didn't remember remember it too. <laughs> I was in, uh, I was now out of it, but uh, what is most important is that if you that you have a plan is good and it's important, but more important is that you and your staff are together and quick and fast and clear about what you have to decide and that you decide. I think that is the most important. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more because um, in, in many time, in many circumstances, I'm saying many cases, um, we do recognize the existence of a disaster plan, but we don't even know uh, how to implement it in uh, uh, how to uh, how the way that you described it in a fast, accurate, and cooperative way, which everyone knows what he's going to do, what he or he is going to do. So um, I, 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 one of my favorite mottos is uh, nothing really exists if you don't really know it. So it's, uh, it's very important, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to, to get to know all this stuff together, of course, with uh, the director, what is the disaster plan and what we are going to do because Disasters is um, uh, is uh, is a motto in um, it's it's something that it, it comes um, in a regular basis in history in world history. So we have to be quite proactive in order to face this kind of um, of emergencies uh, situations. And um, actually, I want I would like to 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 mention that in Ifla we uh, the, the last years we uh, we had uh, this kind of risk management. Um, 
document that it it needs you know to uh, to get more enriched because the situation is changing and of course you have new risks um, every year oh. so maybe and it's possible to 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 go through it every year with a whole whole stuff with everybody so that everybody knows what happened and can add to it as you just said yeah and maybe well now it's just my personal uh, of course opinion i um, i'm thinking loudly let's uh, let's say and maybe to involve also people who are not members of the governing board or, or not are not only members of if hq but uh, people uh, who play um, a really important role, you know, worldwide in order, you know, to form this kind of a risk management um, uh, document because it is important uh, for an association like IFLA and I think for every association, library association. And uh, to answer to my question, this is also a way for library associations to become smarter. And to, uh, to 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 uh, to really add value, you know, to to uh, to their role. I, I Ingrid, you you are coming from um, a country, Canada, with um, many library associations, very active, and um, very energetic, especially in this. Um, in this uh, pandemic, what is uh, what is um, uh, actually your thoughts about uh, the role of uh, um, library associations in the um, in, in in dealing with the COVID? I think it's critical. I um, and it goes back to your earlier question about you know how do we how do we get to decision makers and 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 funders, I think library associations play a, a critical role in, in getting the message out to those levels of our people. Um, but they also have a role to play in setting standards or promoting guidelines or giving information or training. I think training is a big role as well uh, for library associations to promote. Um, so honestly, you know, as I said before, librarians and libraries are not individuals they they form part of a bigger group and i think that's the library associations and and they are active and they could do a lot and i, I just want to encourage them to do so it's important very important uh there is one question about the presentations of the speakers of course this will be in youtube and it will be uh, really available so all the presentations you are going to 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 uh, to, to, to have the chance to see them live as uh, we can uh, see them, uh, we can attend uh, this event now. You will have it in in, in uh, YouTube, so you will have the chance uh, to, uh, to to listen again and, and again the, the presentations. And um, uh, because we have uh, two minutes uh, closing, two hours in this uh, webcast, and I haven't realized that we, we are two hours together. I, I had in my mind, okay, half an hour had just passed. Um, I want to warmly and um, sincerely and deeply uh, thank you very much, Claudia. Thank you very much, Ingrid, and thank you very much, Anthea. Have already um, thank Ellen. I would like to thank very much my colleagues in the organizing committee for the support um, of libraries for this cooperation that made uh, these kind of um, events um, take place. I would like uh, to warmly thank Haram from uh, the Eugenides Library, Aris who was uh, the uh, techni technical supporter. Without him, nothing could have happened. And Leonidas Evgenidis, uh, the president of the Evgenidis Foundation um, for this sophisticated platform that we have right now. And of course, I would like to warmly um, thank all our attendees. After two hours, we have almost 90 people with us. And for me, I think it's a success because I have attended all these uh, almost two years during the COVID, many 
a webcast. And um, I think it's very important to have, um, uh, you know, an average of 100 people with us in this event. Ladies, we, we will be in touch. Please keep in touch. And um, I, I deeply appreciate uh, your contribution uh, in this webcast. I wish you all, first of all, health and to all our attendees, uh, health and uh, please um, take care. Thank you very much and see you all very soon. Bye bye. Thank you. So Thank you. Yeah, thank bye, -bye. You. Yeah, okay. bye, -bye <laughs> everybody. See you in Dublin. Bye -bye. See you in Dublin, 26th and 29th of July. First time Thanks. in July, I think, the IFLA, the, the IFLA Congress. So um, uh, please all uh, book, uh, uh, make your reservations and block uh, these uh, days in your calendar. It will be a very, very nice Congress. Um, I can I can tell you. So bye bye. Stay healthy. Bye Take bye. care. Bye. bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.